Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice 121. Today we're looking at an EICR, I'm on light duty, so I'm going to run through this one with you guys from start to finish and we'll see what and if we find anything. This is for an existing customer in the sunny seaside town Bridlington, nice day outside and we're going to have a little look through this from start to finish and see what's what. I'll show you the main intake to begin with because that's always the most interesting part and you can see down here we have got the electrical intake so if we have a little look at this side excuse me disappearing in and out of shot on the um, dual record you can see we've got what appears to be a TNS system so you can see the earth uh, is onto the sheath of the um, incoming supply cable it then runs through this head and into an earth bar on the top there. Now we know that we are to assume unless we have um, prior information from the supplier that most TNS systems at some point within this supply arrangement will be TNCS so we base our, our workings on that and we'll get to that later on in this investigation. Um, you can see we come out the top of the head and we swoop off into a uh, prepay meter and then off from the meter to this lovely little board here and you can see straight away we've got no RCD protection, obviously no AFDD protection and also there's no SPD in sight anywhere. So we've got those things at the main intake that we've observed before we even start. Now, best advice I can give you before you begin any of your electrical work, investigations and such, is to just go around the place and see what works. Now I've done this off camera already and most of the sockets and switches and bits and pieces are working but there's a few that aren't and this is one of the reasons you do that so the lights in the kitchen these aren't working now i'm going to guess looking at it we've got tubes with blackened ends the starters look like they're forever years old and the rest of the fittings are in the best condition i think they've just been up there and not had anything done with them um, in the time the property's been rented so this is kind of an extension just on the ground floor there's no rooms above here, but again, nothing too disastrous in this room. It looks okay on the surface. Um, you see we've got cables kind of clipped up the wall here, popping out from the corners of the, above the skating boards, which is never a good sign. And in the meter cabinet, we've got a loose end here. I have had a bolt pen quickly on that, it is dead. But still, who knows if that can be switched on somewhere else. I've got a little bit of the inner core is visible at the top of this pendant and also this dimmer switch whilst the wall lights operate on this side so you've got those to illuminate the central light and this feels really rickety it's not actually doing anything and that doesn't work so that's something else straight away that we've seen um, check your switching at the top and bottom of the stairs don't forget either end so we know we've got that working down here Light fitting at the top, I can hear the smoke alarms beeping away, so obviously they're flat as a fart. Uh, if we see here, we've got this switch top of the stairs, and it is taking that out. Into this front bedroom. Again, we've got a surface mount socket just down there. Nothing especially wrong with that as a rule, but usually indicates elements of DIY when you see bits and pieces of that. Switch in here. So that is working. Point of note with the light fittings near the windows in 60s and 70s, people tended to do that because they didn't like the shadows for viewable from outside when they were getting changed after work on a winter's night or in the morning. You know, it's something they tried to cover up and hide away from by putting the light fittings near the windows. Whether that actually ever worked or not, <laughs> who knows. In here, we've got one of these old light fittings with a heating element in that's um, just functioning as a light now for some reason. It's got an orange light in it. <laughs> so, that is what it is, I guess. Nothing in the airing cupboard because, as you might have noticed, the main intake, it's been converted to a combi boil out already. So somebody's done that at some stage. But there is a bit of loose wiring in there. You can see we've got another cut off end, so we need to check that, see if that can be energized from anywhere. So it's just been a little bit nosy. So we've got a plug top down here, which swoops off up and into the loft and um, is not currently secured to that wall. And again, point of note with your plug tops, some people think because it's on a plug top it doesn't necessarily form part of the electrical installation and thus your inspection, if you're actually reading the regs, something that is on a plug top can still form part of the physical electrical system as we would inspect it. And in this case, if that's going off to supply 
fixed accessories within the loft space, it's something you want to be taking into account on your EICI in my opinion. See we've got again some basic insulation on show above there, where the light is actually working and the switch there. Just to show you outside, that's the flat single storey extension for the kitchen and that back room I showed you downstairs. So it's um, bigger downstairs than it is upstairs. Another surface box on there and again we've got cables going off, although that is an aerial cable rather than a power one. That kind of is where we're at, you know, there's not a great deal of accessories around the place looking at it. The short on sockets, which is indicating the, the wirings of an age that um, it's maybe time to be thinking about a rewire, regardless of its its condition. Um, we have every short on sockets, you see again we've got the surface ones down here. I think there's only another one in this front room. Yeah. Just on the side of the chimney breast there. They're the only power points in the lounge. Uh, in this back room, there's a few more in here. So we've got a few dotted about there. Again, I think there was just a one or two in this little study or bedroom. I think it looks like there's just one actually. I know we have got a second one. So we've got a couple there. The kitchen had plenty of power points. We can go through that in a bit more detail now. You can see we've got fuel on this side fuel on that side and we do have an electric is it an electric oven? Uh, do, 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 do. no it's gas oven here it's gas it's firing away grill he said so we don't have an electric cooker point according to what I can see in front of my very eyes we do have a little extractor up here which appears to not be working I don't know if there's a spare for that in the back of the cupboard somewhere it would be perhaps at the top, so I'll have a little investigation of that because that's currently not working. I'm sure there'll be an isolation point for it somewhere, or it's just died of death. Um, yeah, that's one to have a little look at. Let's go back to the consumer unit now. Again, you can see in there the yeah, um, comp boiler I was talking about, so somebody has fitted one of those. I'm going to take you off the jewel recording because you can't really see me while I'm in here. We'll have a look at the consumer unit, jump back on with the um, inspection. Okay, so I've vanished from the screen now and we can have a look at this and see exactly what we've got. So we've got a Molus consumer unit, you can see it's plastic, there's a bit of a big hole in the top there so that's not going to meet our IP4X. And we have got our 100 amp main switch, 16 milli tails but we are on an 80 amp supply. We've got a lighting circuit, another lighting circuit, upstairs sockets, kitchen sockets, heating, uh, the great unknown, supposedly a spare and downstairs sockets. So there is good division there among the circuits looking at it. So that's gonna be kind of the, the sockets in the front room and the dining room, perhaps that back office space, we'll call it. That's one just across there. We'll call that an office, probably a bedroom. Um, spare way, spare way, we'll see if they are when we get the lid off. Central heating, which is going off to this boiler and you can see it runs through this spare here. Again, I would imagine that that was fitted at a time it would have needed RCD protection. Most of these ideal boilers do say in the instructions they need 30 milliamp RCD protection. That's kind of been ignored by the um, installer, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt there. Um, yeah. So obviously, looking at this straight away, we are under the stairs. This is a plastic consumer unit. It does have an open hole in the top of it that's beyond IP4X and we don't have any RCD protection, any SPD protection, and obviously we now have the um, AFDDs appearing in the 18th edition amendment too, to throw into our reporting um, based on electrical installation. Now, obviously this was designed and installed to a version of the regs that didn't have that technology available to it, so to come along and say these all need AFDDs because we're now deciding that our recommendation is a should, is harsh in my opinion, but um, we'll get all this isolated now, Obviously there's only so far I can go with my isolation because I can't isolate these tails in a safe way anywhere. I'm not going to pull the service fuse for that. So we need to remember when the cover's off on this, we will still have live terminals on the input to that main switch. So we need to be careful of that. Um, and equally, we do have these cut ends. I think essentially this cut end here runs straight up and into the tank cupboard for that other cut end. I think it is just that one cable and this probably used to go into the spare here and run off and power what would have been a wiring centre up in that boiler cabinet. That's what my spider senses are telling me at the start of this. Um, but yeah, 
let's open this up. We'll do some dead tests, see what we've got on what circuit. Um, you can go around, some people will just put these on a circuit at a time and go around with a socket and see, or a plug-in socket tester and see what's on what circuit. I prefer to do it under dead conditions, so you just link out your, your line and your CPC and go off and gather your R1, R2s and see if you can obtain a value at whatever accessories you would expect on that circuit. And then obviously when you come to do your functional testing at the end, you can then you know see what, what is what and make sure that it does kind of match up with what the dead testing and the functional testing show you. Anyway, waffling, let's get this stripped apart, isolate it as safely as we can, and um, move on with some testing to see what we've got before we start pulling the system to pieces. So yeah, I should say before we go off and do that, one of the reasons I do do some of the dead testing first, and that is basically just an IR test, just to see if we've got good insulation resistance on these circuits. It kind of will lean me towards the level of sampling on the circuit accessories, so how much we are going to open and have a look at, you know, before we delve into all of that. Otherwise, you can dismantle the system and potentially introduce a fault that wasn't there to start with. If you go along these lines first, you know that what you're observing is something that's existing in the system. It's just the way I do it. Other people approach it differently. There's no set rules as long as you come to the right conclusions. Let's open it up and have a look. Okay, so first impressions inside here are not too bad, actually. It doesn't look terrible. It looks like it's been reasonably well dressed. We do have to be a little bit careful because, as we know, the tails coming into here are still energised, so we're keeping a safe distance from those. Fortunately, they're in the side of the board, well out of the way of anything else, so we shouldn't have to interfere with those or come into any contact. Once I come to the testing, I'm going to use my insulated, um, insulated pliers, long nose pliers, if I can get my words out, pop some gloves on and just belts and braces, make sure I'm taking adequate precaution, pop a pair of goggles on and such as well. Just in case they were to pop out or I was to do something stupid and come into contact with something I shouldn't, um, I'm happy that that's a safe system of work. There is someone else in here with me as well today. We do have um, our cir final circuits. So if we look in here, we have got the conductors in all the right places that we would expect. These two that were saying nothing or spare do actually have conductors in them. And you'll see there we've got blue and brown. So that's a more recent addition. Looking at the cable that drops off under the floor, it looks like an older style cable. So looking at it from the outside, you know, you wouldn't notice any difference between the existing wiring that's red and black and this blue and brown cable. So it's not always um, visible from externals of accessories to date your cables, or at least have a rough idea. So it is important while you're doing your EICRs, you actually open stuff up and have a look. Because there's a good chance that this circuit, uh, when it was installed, would have required RCD protection. Um, but we'll see what that does. I'm looking at it, it looks to drop down and go outside through an air brick. So I suspect it's either going off to do the garage across the other side of the driveway at the side of this house or to an external socket. And we'll have a look at that later on in our inspection. One of the other things to check right at the beginning is that you have the same number of lines, neutrals and CPCs. And in this case, we've got 11 of each. The reason you do that is some older lighting circuits wouldn't have carried a CPC. So at least we know from the um, distribution board consumer unit on this install, our installation does appear to have a CPC on those lighting circuits. So we've got that. So now I'm going to get gloved up, put my goggles on, make myself as safe as possible, get the test set into place. And we're just going to do some basic checks. I'm going to see if I've got any continuity between the neutrals and the earths on this install. I'm just going to do that at 250 volts. Um, as an IR test and I'm also going to bell it out for continuity as well and then we will repeat that test between our lines and CPCs. Obviously everything is unplugged. We do have some lights that are in circuit that we need to be mindful of. Also things like the boiler but I've got the spare turned off. It is a double pole spare as well so that's opened up both the line and the neutral. There's nothing really else that I'm worried about causing us an issue. So it's just to be mindful of that. If you do have a load of down lights in for example or if you've got um, things in the uh, an EV charge point or an oven that might be causing you issues where you can get some leakage to earth through elements and such. Just to be aware of the fixed appliances and equipment that's connected into the wiring. In this case, we're pretty lucky. So I'm just looking to see if we've basically got any obvious shots in the system. And we start with neutral and earth because we've got no RCD protection. And usually, you know, if we had an issue there, they'd be pulling that fault out. So we need to check for that. And then we're going to do some continuity tests. So we'll run through and make sure our protective Bonding conductors are in place, that our earthing conductors in place, 
and then we can do some R1, R2 testing on our final circuits, make sure that end of line and all the way through those circuits, we have a measurement between the line and the CPC on the lights, that we have full continuity around the ring of all of the conductors, line neutral and air, and then that we do our figure of eight testing on these circuits, um, and equally that we see where this goes, and this one here, because it was unmarked, I think that's just the light in this cupboard, to be honest. And then we can um, form an opinion. I'm not going to run through the full test process. I may show a little bit of testing here and there um, as we run through it. But um, yeah, I'm not going to do start to finish. I've done that on another video or two already. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to piece it together as a whole complete thing. But we'll just pull in and drop bits and pieces here and there. Okay, so I've done those brief little checks I always like to start and do at the beginning of EICR. It's just something I've always done. It's not part of the actual process as such, um, but it's just something I do just to give me a few pointers from the beginning. Now we're going to run through and check our R1, R2 on the lighting circuit. You see I have disconnected the CPC from the earth bar and also the line, and this is just to make sure I don't introduce an error when I'm putting things back together. It's so easily done where somebody may put a line in with a CPC in a circuit accessory and forget about it or make a mistake somewhere in here and whilst when you turn everything back on at the end it should go with a flash and bang. It's not always the case and you can leave a fault in the system so if you've not switched the light back on or something. So I always try and disconnect things, connect them together outside of any of the equipment so I know when I'm re-terminating stuff there's a better chance of me getting it right than wrong. Again, just my approach to it. I'm not saying that's necessarily the right way. But we can run around the lighting circuit now, get our R1, R2, make sure that we've got that CPC and line um, continuity through that circuit. And then we'll just repeat that for all of these. I'll show you me gathering a few of the results using the TIS uh, socket and C set. So we can um, go off and do that. Sorry, the light mate set from TIS. Again, with the MFT Pro Plus. And we can just get some values for R1, R2 there. You see, I've got my proving unit and voltage indicators got some lights set up it is pretty light in here anyway you'll know i've popped the um earth leakage clamp onto the to the earth conductor the reason it's not around the line and neutral in this case because i'm not really looking at leakage current within my installation it's obviously isolated in essence so there's nothing going on in here i'm looking at what may be coming through the earthing system external and while this is a tns supposedly we need to remember to assume that it could well be TNCS in the wider network and if there is an issue out there we could start importing some currents into our installation while I'm working on it. So I've got that set there, so I've got a point of reference to see that's set to max, it's not um, the current value, so if I turn the hold off, you see that's the minimum, that's our maximum that we've recorded. If I zero that off now, figure out how to do it. I'm sure there is a way, but just a simple on and off for those heathens like me. We can see we've got an active value of about 3 milliamps or so that that's picking up, flowing down here at this present time. So again, I'll just set that to maximum and I can see what the maximum has gone on there. Just to keep me safe, while obviously I'm interfering with these connections, if there is an excess current that starts jumping up in there, I want to know about it. That's how I approach it. Um, diverted neutral currents. Covered it a lot. Go off and check it out. But let's move on now. Let's go and get these values for the lighting circuit for our R1, R2, um, and then we can move through all the rest of them. Okay, so we've got the TIS set up. We're in the right TN mode. Not that it matters for the dead test, but getting ready for some of those tests later on. Continuity meters all set up. We're in the right connection points in the top of the test set. We run up into this light mate adapter, which is going into the flex drop from the ceiling rose, and then we're on the CPC bar, sorry, CPC terminal within that ceiling rose. We've got the light switch in the on position. And if we hit the test button, we should get a value of impedance uh, continuity between that line and CPC. Now it's measuring 3.19 ohms, which is a little bit higher than I would anticipate. It's only a relatively short circuit. Um, it is only in one mil, but it's literally just coming upstairs and doing three or four lights. There's not a great deal in there. So that is a, a red flag to me. There's something going on within this wider system and we'll get to what that is in just a sec. So this is the light fitting in the bedroom outside the flat roof, which had the basic insulation on show earlier on, if you remember. And if you look, I don't know how the lighting is on this. Let's pop the flashlight on. You can see there is a very corroded um, CPC terminal on there. 
and that is going to cause us an issue with our impedance values so our r1 r2 measurements on this circuit now end of line is in the bathroom i've been and taken a measurement in there as well and it's measuring it's been around it's measuring over four ohms in there it's still probably going to comply with the maximum value of overcurrent protection um, ZS that is applicable to that B6. So it's still probably going to function even based on that. But we know those continuity values are nothing like right. If we go and look in the regs at the value of resistance on a 1mm twin and earth cable running around this very short circuit, shouldn't be anything like that. So this is something that we need to be flagging up in our report. So this is one of those things where it's not going to be something that is going to present as something that's immediately dangerous. Is it potentially dangerous? Could that um, fault lead to an issue as the system is used? Or, you know, this could have, looking at it, it doesn't look something that's um, that happened over a short period. It looks to have been something over a longer period. You can see there's actually a crack in the ceiling as well, some water staining, someone's had a go at covering it with fresh paint. So yeah, that's one of those that you need to factor into your reporting. And I'm certainly gonna be making note of that, especially when you look metallic accessories and when I'm going to pop some of these off in a bit we'll see what values of R1 R2 we can get from those as well. That's just a quick look at continuity testing on a lighting radial circuit and using some of the results from that to point you in the right direction. We'll compare it on that circuit with a ZS measurement as well and just see what goes on as we do that later on and again we'll do that quite safely I'll show you how you can do that in a safe manner without putting yourself any risk and maybe it'll show us something maybe it won't bit of an experiment. Let's go and do some continuity testing on a ring final circuit now. So back at the consume unit now and we're looking at this ring final circuit it's for the kitchen sockets. You'll see I've had to take the um, sleeving off because somebody had twisted the CPCs together and put them in the same sleeving. It's really annoying if you are doing installs please don't do that because it makes the testing pain in the ass later on. Anyway got that separated we're just going to check our continuity between um, the ring final continuity sorry of the lines the neutrals and the CPCs I've just got the lines in here to demonstrate how you do it but basically you clip onto each leg of the ring hit test on the instrument and it should if it's intact give you a value just try and get that in a better light so you can see it there we go so we've got 0 0.44 on that one um, we'll take it straight over onto the neutral I can do this one-handed with the camera as well. Uh, try and make sure you get a good connection in the crocodile clips. If you, um, oh, this is testing my eyesight. Make sure you get it in where it's nice and bitey, so you're getting a good connection onto that. Again, that's the neutrals. This should come out at a similar value. Again, I'll try and get you in some decent light to show you. It's 0 0.43. I don't know if that's coming across on camera because I can't really see I'm that close up to the screen and I'm got my glasses on and now we can have a look at the CPCs and again make sure you get those in the crocodile clips make sure that it's not touching itself because like I said this is just bare copper now and they are pretty close together but they're apart at the back there they're not touching so I'm happy with that we should see a different value on this one again 1.67 times for those of you who are wanting to play with the maths and you can see we've got 0 0.7, hopefully you can see that. So roughly speaking, we're under double. So you'd expect if you mess about with a calculator, that's not going to be too far away. So now is what we need to do is jout the legs of the ring. Now, you could include the neutral in this as well. In fact, you could omit this test entirely on any ICR. I'm just doing it because um, I've spotted a few of the Glen Remlins I'm concerned about. So I'm doing a bit of belts and braces on this kitchen circuit. You could just take a measurement of ZS and exclude your dead testing if you wished on an inspection with an EICR. It's not initial verification, so you don't have to run through the same set of tests. It's the inspector's discretion at the end of the day. People often get upset about that and um, take things a little bit too far. And again, it's the possibility of introducing a fault that wasn't there. You need to remember this should have been designed, installed inspected and tested when it was first done to the required standard you are just here to verify its safety but because I know this hasn't been in inspected for decades because I know somebody has been messing around with it sticking extra bits and pieces in and spares off all over the place I'm going a little bit more invasive on this than I perhaps maybe normally would and it also makes for some nice content for you guys and girls to watch but yes we can see the legs of the ring quite clearly here I'm going to bridge over now the line and CPC on this leg so basically you've got 
We'll call this leg one and the other one leg two. You need to take the line from leg two and mix it with the CPC of leg one and then repeat that on the other cable as well. So the um, line from leg one to the CPC of leg two, essentially creating a figure of eight. And you can include that with the neutral as well. Make a figure of eight with that on a separate test should you wish. But for the purposes of results you're entering on your test sheet, this is what's talking about big R1 and big R2. So I'll get that set up now. So that's the jump over leads on. You can see essentially we've got one leg of the rings line connected to the other leg of the rings CPC and vice versa. We can now go out to the kitchen sockets, which are just there with the MFT Pro and also its test lead, which I've got here for the socket circuit. And we should be able to get a measurement that's kind of consistent through all of these sockets, subject to having no spares in the circuit. Now we'll start with this one. Get back into the test. So you can see we're still in continuity. Right, go. We should get a value. And we haven't. Why is that? Oh, that's me putting the probes in the wrong hole. You see, if you go to the colour coded options, you need to remember that we're measuring between the um, plus, look back in the menu, plus and minus, which is basically the line and the neutral terminal on the top of the tester. So we need to put our CPC in, line in. So a school by error, everyone makes them. Another school by error, switch the socket on. So this just shows easy to make a mistake and you see we've measured 0.49 now if we check across the other side of the socket it's always worth doing because sometimes you can get high impedance through one side to the other and then just repeat that across a number of other sockets and see we've got 0.41 so this should be largely consistent so you've got 0.47 on this side for whatever reason a little bit higher, sorry, lower, and it's dropped again. So I'm not surprised because they look a little bit greasy, a lot of these socket fronts. They've certainly been in for a period of time, so to see a difference between one side to the other is not uncommon. Again, 0.38 on that side, 0 0.4. A little bit of a difference you will get some sort of variation just from the tolerance on the test set and the contacts within the socket front so don't expect them to match perfectly you're just looking for something close 0 0.37 0 0.37 so these first couple on this side we're measuring a little bit higher so let's see how much higher it was again you see it's dropped 0 0.38 low battery on the test set, so I'm going to have to pop that on charge. But that's kind of what, when, oh God, I'm in terrible lighting. When you go around the socket ring, the, obviously this property has been empty a period of time as well. There's been no one in here for about six months. If the socket's fronts are greasy or there's a poor contact with inside it, put the plug top in and out a few times just to try and clean that connection up. As you move around the ring and you're going across different sides of the socket front as well, in and out, just to make sure you're cleaning them up as best you can and you should roughly find that most of those values for your R1, R2 come out to the same sort of figure and we were around 0 0.4 ohms on that circuit now if you remember if I can remember we had roughly I think it was 0 0.44 for our continuity on the um, line and we had 0 0.7 for the continuity on the CPC so that works out if you add those two together to uh, 1.14. Now if you divide that by 4 you should roughly come out around about where you'd expect to be at each socket front. So if you, for the sake of easy maths, call it 1.2, you're around 0 0.3. So we're actually measuring a little bit above that. Now uh, there is a reason for that. Like I said, there's the quality of the terminations in the socket front itself. So we're not measuring off the wires in the back of the socket. This is including some extra piece of equipment that may have some impedance. We've also got this lead in the top of the test set, which is going to add some impedance as well. Um, it's been zeroed off, but even so, you've got the contact pins within that socket front. It can all add a little bit of um, resistance to the values you measure. So don't set that in stone. Sometimes you can get a variation and it's perfectly normal. I'm going to play around on this circuit now. We'll get the test set with a new set of batteries in 
and see if I can get that value to drop down just a little bit. We may even take a measurement off the back of one of the sockets just to see what's going on. Because as I said, these are pretty old and scabby and I don't think they're helping us out. So I've got all the terminals back in now. I've just been through and done the IR testing. Surprisingly, it was clear on all of the socket circuits. A little bit low on the lighting circuits and again, that's probably to do with some of the corrosion that I showed you earlier on in this. But generally speaking, it's not too bad. Socket circuits are measuring off the scale, which is unusual for an older install. And um, we just have an issue on a couple of the lighting circuits. One of them wasn't particularly anything that I'd be especially concerned with. We were still measuring in the hundreds of megahms. The other one was 35 megahm, I think. And like I say, that's due to moisture that's been getting into that circuit. So that's gonna need a bit of ascension, even though, technically speaking, we're above that one, two megahm even when you take into account the issue of these values of insulation resistance that some people go on about when you've got resistance in parallel and series of each other and how that's different. Um, yeah, we're still okay, but there is a problem there. So I'm gonna get this put back together now and um, we can go and get some Z-Esh measurements and compare them to some of the dead tests. And then we'll have a little look through some of the inspections and observations as an overall assessment on this. Um, and um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Okay, so I've got the power back on now to the socket circuits. We can get the ZS measurements off those. I've got the TIS test set here with some charged up batteries in it now. Again, if you're doing your ZSs, you need to make sure you get your leads in the right place from the start, and these do colour coordinate in that case. So we can turn this on and make sure we go into the right setting and we've got it all loaded up correctly. So it's just booting up here. If we go into our loop impedance testing, we don't need to be on no trip because there are no RCDs. So we can just go on to LPE. We can choose our overcurrent protective device. It's a B type MCB and it's rated to 32 amps and save that. Now, again, down to 0.4. This just helps you with the pass and fail icon that'll come on the screen as you do the test. It's really not important or just the way it actually functionally does the measurement but um, it will tell you if you've passed or failed essentially is part of the result. So if we hit the test button here, you see it's gonna give us um, a maximum fault current level at this socket front between the line and the CPC and also our circuit impedance, which has come out at 0 0.51 ohms. Now, just for interest, if we was to stick this on no trip, let's see, we shouldn't get any real difference or uplift in it because there's no RCD in circuit. Um, but the instrument does obviously work in a different way when it carries out this test. So let's have a little look and see what value it gives us just as an experiment. And roughly speaking, it's sort of about the same. So again, we're looking on our LPU, we've got a similar sort of value for the fault current and also a similar value for our circuit impedance. I'll note on the neutral, so the line neutral loop, it's actually a little bit lower. And again, this isn't a true TNCS system at the head. By external of the install, I would expect at some point it is. So, you know, it's, it's not far away, but it's not precise. So if we um, go back into that LPE and just repeat that test again, just for the hell of it, you'll see it's defaulted back to a different type of fuse. And again, we've got roughly zero point, high 0.4s to 0 0.5 ohms. Now, I've sort of forgotten what our dead test measurements were. I think we were coming out at 0.4-ish. At the R1R2 um, measurement of the socket front, and the calculation was telling us that it should be around 0 0.3. I went onto the back of the socket fronts and I came out just a little bit above 0 0.3, it was 0 0.3233 on the ring vinyl. There was actually a spare which was taking the measurement from. So that kind of will play out based on what our ZE is at the in intake. So we're measuring sort of 0 0.14 there for our ZE. So if we add that on to you know, it's sort of there or thereabouts, isn't it? So yeah, the maths is playing kindly with us. And again, we can move around this socket circuit and just get that value of ZS. It'll be a little bit lower at some of the other ones, I expect. So if we try it on this one, just for the hell of it while we're here. Might as well save that value, so I've got it for later. <coughs> Excuse me. And this should be a little bit lower, and it is because this is on the actual ring vinyl circuit, and you'll see as that value of impedance drops, the fault current level rises. So again, 
let's just do that on no trip and see what it comes up with. Just a little interesting experiment for no real purpose in terms of your ICR. This is just for me being a little bit nosy um, and seeing if there is any variation between the different ways this test set gathers the values. Uh, and you can see it's pretty consistent again. So, and we're actually measuring lower in this case with our line and neutral loop. So, so there's maybe some variation in the supply network and that spare affecting things. You know, it is um, not a super duper accurate test for asphalt loop impedance with an MFT. Um, so there are gonna be some variations there in your measurements done. Well, too much weight in it is what you're looking for is, is patterns and consistency and that there is a correlation there with your dead test measurements. Right, so I'm going to go and get the value of ZS on that lighting circuit upstairs now. The reason I always do go around and take an impedance measurement on every circuit is because if I've been interfering with terminations within that consumer unit and circuit accessories having a nosy inside them to see what the installation looks like, I want to be as sure as possible that I've not introduced a fault through the course of my work and taking an airfoot loop impedance measurement at the end of everything else is a very good way to do that, especially on systems that don't have RCDs in circuit because they are quite likely to pick out any silliness in the way you have put stuff back together, um, you know, it's just that and it re-energizing the system. But always loop impedance test is just something that I think is quite sensible and as I'm going to show you right now on this lighting circuit, Contrary to popular belief and some very, very poor guidance from trainers out there, you can do it quite safely. So you'll see we've got the lighting circuit energised now. Lights are on, light switch is on. Over to here, I've got the crocodile clip onto the CPC. You'll see that that is an open connection point, so you would need to be keeping away from that. And we've also got the line going into the pendant drop. We're measuring voltage on the instrument so we can take our ZS measurement. Point of note, I put all these probes and clips in with the power off and then you can reinstate the power and um, start to take your reading. Don't be starting to mess about inside the ceiling roses unless you were super duper confident and trained to work live. Um, it's always easy to just turn power off, takes a second, put your probes in the right place, go pop the power back on. You'll hear from me being slightly out of breath as a fat overweight electrician running up and down the stairs so it's good for me a bit of exercise and then if we hit the test button I'm miles away from any of the bitey stuff so I'm stood literally across the other side of the room in absolutely no harm's way and you will note we have got a different reading to the dead test measurements so we are measuring underneath that value so we are quite a bit underneath it we're getting 1.49 now various reasons that that might be the case. One, there's some parallel um, earth path that's coming into play through the bonding within the building. So it could be that this lighting circuit is somehow connected into uh, the, the heating pipes, for example, going back to the boiler and it's picking up another fortuitous path to earth. Or it could be that under energized conditions, that corroded terminal that's causing us a problem is presenting in a different way and that the um, test set is um, obviously it's taking its reading in a different way to what it would be through the cost of dead testing. But we're getting a lower value, so that's telling us the, the dead test is a worst case scenario. So if you were to enter those details onto your test sheets, you know, you would be on the side of safety in using them. Where it can become a problem is you can start recording faults and issues that maybe aren't there uh, or aren't such a safety concern if you've got things like um, steel containment that's actually forming part of the earthing system that you've missed during the course of your inspections, for example. It can happen with inexperienced inspectors. So just to keep that in mind, um, we've still got an issue on that circuit. I know there is because we've seen it, we've observed it, we've found it. So we can report on that accordingly. But yeah, just to point, we've come to make that live measurement. It's less upset with that corroded CPC terminal and it's possibly picking up a fortuitous path back to earth in other systems that are now connected. So obviously we had our CPC in line outside of the board when we took our dead test and now they're in the, the terminal bars within the consumer unit. So there's other factors that could be at play. Just to explain that. So now we've got the system fully back energized. You can see all switched back on, everything back in the right place. So this measurement's all good. No RCD testing obviously on this one because there's no RCDs. I've popped the clamp meter back onto the CPC there. Sorry, main air just to see what the leakage value is for both AC and DC. Um, 
then it's it's acceptable for, for all. There's not a lot of leakage current going on there. Again, you can clamp the tails, which is going to give you a better indication of what's going on in your install. Again, DC and the old AC were measuring quite low. Whilst I was doing the work and we had the system isolated, so we knew our install wasn't forming any part of any leakage currents, this did reach a maximum of sort of 11 milliamps. And that's just stuff that's going to be circulating in the network naturally anyway. You will find that um, regardless, because you need to remember that the earthing systems in neighbouring properties are all tied together. And if you get some currents flowing down them, you can expect to see them presenting in your install and then trying to work their way back through utility services or whatever else is going on. Again, just to run through some of the observations that we've seen on this one, you may have just spied there. The gas bond is a little bit on the small side so we have that issue i'm not going to run through the certificate i've done that on other videos you want to see certificates been built in on naked desktop naked fast test or electrical om they're all on my channel already i've demonstrated how to fill your eicr paper working accordingly but just to run through some of the stuff that we spotted here obviously the bonding is a bit small for both the water and the gas we've got that um which is unterminated at this end and unterminated in the understair, oh sorry, the bathroom boiler cupboard. Again, I've checked that physically, looking at it end to end, so I know that's what that cable does. Really, it should be removed, but it's not actually posing any real danger. It can't be re-energized at any point along its length, so no huge dramas. We've got the open hole on top of the consumer unit. We've got the lack of any RCD protection to the final circuits with cables buried in the fabric of the building, luminaires in bathrooms, sockets that could be potentially used outside. Obviously there's no AFDDs, there's no SPD, and it's plastic under the stairs. We've also got basic insulation on show on a couple of light fittings. So there's this one in the front room, it's only just peeping out there through the ceiling rows, and then the one that's upstairs. We've also got a few bits and pieces that are not functioning. So these kitchen lights, there is actually power to them and the circuit bells out just fine, but obviously the fittings themselves are broken. These socket fronts are measuring, a, I wouldn't say it's anything out of the ordinary especially, but they are adding impedance to that circuit and it's just the edge of the accessories. There's bits of grease in there. And like I say, this has been unoccupied and it's all been used for a period of time. So you would expect to see that. There is the, Blue and ground cable that he's going to do an outside socket. Obviously, there's no RCD protection on that. Um, yeah, that is a very naughty, naughty bit of work. Whoever did that way back whenever that was. We've also got some outside lights and they are running in twin and earth CPC cable outside. I'm not going to go out and show you because the neighbours are out in the back garden and you'll see there there's um, cars and whatnot out there. I just don't want to sound like a bit of a wally chatting to my phone outside. So I have to take my word on that one. There's a um, floodlight at the back got some twin earth cable and there is also a floodlight down this side passage here the same uh, there's the light fitting in the bathroom which has got that whole heating element in it and obviously there's the metal uh, enclosure on it and the lack of any rcd protection there's the plug top going up to the loft there's the corroded um, fitting in that bedroom so there's another one as well so the one in the front bedroom is fine the air terminal within this room here corroded as well in this flat roof um, so yeah, it's impacting a little bit on our dead test measurements as you would expect because they're gonna see that poor termination, that poor connection. It was less uh, noticeable during the course of the loop impedance testing because often that can pick up your parallel paths through the rest of the system. As I said, it's why it's super duper important. If you've got doubts about an install, don't omit any of the tests. You know, you can be as invasive as you want as the inspector. I've looked at this and seen it's not been looked at in decades. There is rope bits of wiring going on around the, the place, bits clipped to the wall, we've got plug top running into the loft, there's open ends that have been cut off, people have interfered and added to it and not really done it correctly as far as I'm concerned. Accessories that aren't working. So I've gone more in depth on this than perhaps a new build, for example, that's in good condition or an install that we've done and we know is sound in the past and we're going to check it where we might be happy to see if there's been any changes and adjustments made to the install get some loop impedance measurements, because remember, you're not there to do initial verification, you're there to verify safety. Um, a lot of inspectors get mixed up on that. They think you've got to fill the test sheet in in full and you're a cowboy if you don't. There's a huge difference between doing your job diligently and walking that fine line of inspecting correctly and not introducing a fault through the course of your work. You know, it's just common sense, it comes with experience. 
don't sit in your van and just fill the test sheet in because you think jobs are good and you did it five years ago when you rewired it because you don't know who's been in there messing about go and have a nosy around make up your mind yourself um, if you want to apportion any codes to any of this in the comments i will cover it in a video in a few weeks time or whatever i'll mention maybe show the codes or something and say what i've said for the observations i've made if there's anything in this video that i've not mentioned and you've spotted maybe drop that in the comments as well because you never know there may be a secret competition at play on this one so if there's anything you've noticed that i've not mentioned maybe drop that in as well otherwise thank you to everyone who's stuck to the end to watch and if you do have any wider questions or want me to cover anything in a video in the future let me know i'm happy to try and show any aspects of working as an electrician remember these are primarily aimed at helping apprentices in their training journeys and also encouraging people into the electrical industry and for me to look back when i'm grey old and even fatter so don't critique too hard if you find them boring too in depth or whatever go and watch some of the far more exciting channels check out david savory if you want some banter and giggles he's my favorite youtuber and i don't mind admitting that otherwise i'll see you on the next one thumbs up thumbs down thank you for watching